Yep, we are both live now. Nishit Bhai, Manish Bhai, we are both live. Uh, yes, I can see Facebook is live. And what about Manish Bhai? Okay, good afternoon everybody. This is uh, Jay Lakhani from Hindu Academy. Under lockdown in my own home, so my my volunteers and my musketeers are talking to me on the phone and, and looking at the, uh, the the emails that you sorry the messages you send on uh, either WhatsApp or sorry on uh, YouTube or on Facebook, and they will interact with me and we will carry on with this session now. Sorry, a bit you know rustic, but this is how we work in lockdown. Okay, so. Uh, Nishit Bhai, first of all, tell us about our activity on the e-learning zone and what kind of success or failure we've had. So, yes, thank you, Jay Bhai, uh, and uh, welcome to today's broadcast. It's always nice to be here on Saturday <laughs> to talk about uh, Hinduism. So, I'd just like to share with the viewers that we have launched uh, a, a Basics of Hinduism online learning course and uh, the link to sign up, you can find it on hindu-academy.com. And uh, for those of you who have logged in, we've got almost 1,400 people who are signed up for the course. We've had such a warm response from you all. Uh, also, we've had some questions and some challenges uh, about accessing the, the course material and the platform. So what I will say is that uh, the course platform can be a little bit slow, but the material is all up and ready. Uh, the course is over eight modules. Uh, we have already uploaded half of it, and we are going to aim to finish the rest of the course over the next couple of days. Nishitabai, can, can I just stop you for the moment? Let me tell our viewers. This is the reason that we had extremely, we didn't expect such an overwhelming response. We had roughly about 1,400 people prepared to sign in, and we were struggling to get them all logged in. We were struggling, but they must pay tribute to our team who has worked very closely in a very beautiful manner for us to be able to kind of get this thing off the ground. And must pay special tribute to Nishit Pai, who is the kind of main person setting up the e-learning course. Manish Pai, who has been kind of doing tremendous work in upset, you know, uploading material. And Kaival, uh, Jay Shank, uh, Sita. Uh, I hope I not forgot anybody. Uh, so our team has been and Vijay Pai Hirani. So we, our team has been working very hard, and we have managed to successfully launch this particular site. And it's thanks to my team who are doing the hard work in the background. So I have to pay full tribute to our team for this particular, you know, um, project that was launched to be successful. Carry on. Sorry, Nishit, but I had to step in. <laughs> no problem. So the course is laid out over eight modules. And so some of the questions people have been asking are, how long will it take me to complete the course? So the answer to that is, you can do it as fast or as slow as you want. The, the course is self-paced. So when you start, you can only proceed when you're finished the first module and you go to the next one etc can, can, can i can i can i stop can i stop you for a moment because when i was trying to do it myself and i tried to go and jump the gun and go into the third module it wouldn't let me there's a little lock saying no you can't mr lakani whether you are the teacher or whatever you must go through the process of going through each and every module one by one so please warning you the viewers it is not easy to jump just go slowly according to the plan sorry sorry to yes. inter interfere Nishit, bye. No, that's fine so whenever you finish one section of the module there is a button that says proceed to the next section and only then when it has got confirmation from you that you have, you have done studying that particular section will it unlock the next section this allows you to study all the material in a, in a manner which is the flow of the whole course and it prevents people from jumping between the start, middle, and the end of the course. Uh, I know people get very excited, but this is laid out in such a way that it takes you from the flow, from the basics, and takes you all the way through till the end in a very nice uh, format. The second question I get sometimes is that the site uh, videos are not loading. So the site can be a little bit slow. But if you give it a little bit of time to buffer the videos, then it will be working fine. Uh, we are also planning a webinar uh, on Tuesday at 12 noon UK time. Uh, and that will be a place for people to come and ask any questions about the course. 
and also to interact with JPY uh, live online as well. And the course, uh, the, the the web or the, the online meeting for that, we will send out the details to all the course uh, members um, by email. And you should, I'm still getting, I mean, I'm seeing messages coming saying, I still can't log in. So I think you already explained to them, you don't need to worry about waiting for your login details. You simply go to Hindu dash, Hindu, sorry, forward line, academy.com, and it says on the top, login. Just log in. You can get straight through, through to the course. Am I right, Nishit Bhai? So if they go to hindu-academy.com, that's yeah. where they would go to sign up. Yeah. When they sign up, they will be given an email uh, which will contain their login details okay. and a link to where to log into the course. Okay. All they have to do is click the link in that email, use their username and password, and yeah. they'll be able to log into the course area. Yeah, I got Sam Matthew saying, I haven't received the login information yet, Nishit Bhai. Is it uh, sometimes slow to send in the login information to various people? It, it depends if they've directly registered on the course platform like now, yeah. or whether they've done it before through the form. Okay. So what I would suggest is anybody who is not, who is still waiting for the course logins, to go again to hindu-academy.com and just click on the sign up button and try again. Okay, I'll tell Sam to do the same. He's watching us at the moment. So yes. you so did keep interfering, but I like to kind of interact with people who are already kind of watching and asking questions. But carry on, Nishit Bhai, you wanted to say something more about the e-learning zone. So. Uh, yeah, no, just that anybody who's got questions can feel free to get everything ready for 12 o'clock Tuesday, UK time, and then we will answer all the questions uh, at one go. Wonderful. <clears throat> I just pass on to Manish Bhai to see if he's got any questions. Manish Bhai, have you got any questions, sir? Uh, no, he had actually. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You got all the answers, Manish Bhai. You don't need to ask questions. Okay, can I just make a few comments? You see, the, the, the course itself will be accredited by Hindu Academy to start with, because this is, if you like, the eight modules. But we are waiting for Cambridge Board to come online because they are, they are, they are in shutdown, they are in lockdown. So they are, not, they are simply saying we are waiting. They don't know when they will be able to set up the exam. Normally it's in October that they set up the written exam. But at the moment, because of lockdown, they don't know what to say. So they are saying, please hang on and we'll sort things out. So at the moment, we'll issue Hindu Academy certification at the end of the course. And this is, you know, Vijay Bahirani is the, is the one who is going to look at your answers, mark you, give you a grade and a certificate. So that is a, that's a carrot we can offer immediately. And as soon as Cambridge Board is back out of the lockdown, we can then make sure that you can sit for Cambridge Board exam for the same material. So that is the way we are planning to or can organize the course. Um, Nishit, by anything else you want to add about the course? Uh, no, that, that's it, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, in that case, um, um, Nish, um, Man Manish, by you have some questions? Yes, sir. So, um, question about uh, the economy. Because we've seen uh, economy around the world has uh, plummeted and um, there's economic downturn and... Um, it, uh, be a, there's likely to be big problems uh, on our way. Uh, how can um, uh, you know Hinduism help with this? What is your take on this? Okay, you see. People, the first first problem is health problem, and one of the wonderful things that our prime minister has done, and the whole all the world leaders have praised him to the highest heaven, is that he has valued life more than economy or money. The Western powers, who are supposed to be kind of very mature, etc., have given priority to economy, like the United States, and they are taking gamble with the lives of the people. While our nation, which is considered to be economically a poor nation, took the very hard decision, decision to say we'll, we'll stop the economy but make sure that our people survive. So that is why we, uh, the whole world, you know, all the major leaders, the intelligent leaders are already praising Narendra Bhai Modi for doing a wonderful job of preserving life rather than preserving the economy. Economy can sort itself out in days to come. It is going to be a hard time. And as you said, Manish Bhai, quite correctly, the world that we face after the coronavirus, and unfortunately is going to go on, and we can already see the science case, there is no immediate way of, out of it. So as this particular economy is getting dragged, it is going to be, at the end of it, we're going to end up with not just recession. I'm suggesting, look, I'm not an economist, but I'm suggesting very likely depression. 
We'll have a lot of people unemployed, struggling to survive. Uh, money will be difficult, and a lot of companies will go bust, and a lot of people will be unemployed. As is, we're already seeing that already now. So this is an ongoing struggle. So the economic downfall that we are expecting now, which is not that we want, but this inevitable, is going to create real hassle with humanity. Because up to now, humanity in the last, especially the last century, we have been so caught up with kind of high, making material progress, making more money, you know, buying more material goods, getting more and more worked up about materialism, that we have lost track of the deeper dimension to all of us, which is essentially spiritual rather than material. But now this coronavirus in a way is going to force us, this is the right language, really pull us, drag us to think of something higher than purely material aspiration. So this is on the cards. And this cannot be avoided. It's nothing that I'm expect. I don't want that to happen. But we'll be forced to, in a way, humanity will be forced to take on this idea. It's kind of wonderful, you know, tradition which is a kind of wonderful, you know, tradition which is essentially spiritual, which can hold the hand of humanity to go through this difficult period. We hold the answer. The answer is this, and this is we have been, you know, talking about it for thousands of years. The reason why our tradition has survived for thousands of years. We have ups and downs all the time. Everything is an up and down, including civilizations. We had ups and downs. But we have survived as a single civilization over thousands of years. No other civilization on the face of this earth has done this because we are always focusing on not material aspirations, controlling others, ruling others, stealing their you know, wealth and resources. We are always thinking of higher principles, higher ideals. And that is why we have survived as a single civilization over thousands of years. And we are not going to die that easily. People sometimes say, oh, Mr. Lakhani, Hinduism will die now and blah. No, Hinduism will never die. Do you know why? It is not based on personalities. It is based on principles. And these are very potent ideas that cannot die. Even if all of humanity dies, the principles remain. So this is why Hinduism will never die. The only thing, we'll have ups and downs. We already had lots of ups and downs. And we'll have another downturn with the economy in the, in the days to come. But we are a very sturdy nation, and we have survived many downfalls, and we will definitely survive this and come out winners. In fact, I'm telling you, India will become the role model for the future of the world now. Because now we can see the other nations are struggling to have this position of being the leaders, the world leaders. India has always been, if you like, the, the, the mother of spirituality for the whole of this world. Now, this role will be revived because of the serious economic downturn we see around the corner. And that is where the wonderful teachings we have, look for higher principles, live for higher principles than material chasing out of material things. It's tiresome. It'll just drain you and it'll spit you out. Think of higher ideals, higher principles that will hold your hand in difficult times and revive this kind of human spirit and not get depressed. So the resolution for the economic downturn that we see around the corner lies with the wonderful teachings at the heart of our Hindu tradition. And I'm very proud of this. And this is why I love, you see, the, do you know why I'm doing all this thing, waving my arms? Because the material purpose is so important. It, can, it must be shared. It must be, you know, put across in the world. And we are doing our best in our little, you know, humble manner, using all these gizmos. And it is entering society. No, and we are quite sure. So our wonderful ideas, potent ideas about focusing on spiritual aspirations, looking at inward, looking at our true nature as something not material. Because if you think you are a material being, you chase after material objectives. If you think that you are not a material being but a spiritual being, then the way you look at the world will change dramatically. And that is on the cards. It's a very sad thing to say, but because of the coronavirus, this is going to be revived and refreshed because of this nasty you know, virus that's infecting the world. I will ask one of our volunteers, Nishit Bhai, any other questions? Uh, not yet. I'm still waiting for people to uh, just submit their questions at the moment. OK, OK. Yeah. Let me check with Manish. Okay, so Manish I Bhai? can ask one. Yes, please. Yeah, so sir, in recent times, we heard in the news uh, Julia Roberts, a Hollywood uh, actress, <laughs> She has accepted Hinduism and now a Hindu, practicing Hindu. What is your take on uh, such news? It's good news. Look, a lot of things are happening which are already showing Hinduism in its true light, in its very, very beautiful, colorful and magnanimous light. That is very visible. A lot of clear thinkers in the West, academics, even scientists, have always recognized the potency of Hinduism. The, the, the YouTube channel keeps clicking off, you know, kind of, so I have to kind of re-switch it. Okay, I think it's working again. So there are a lot of forces in the world that are trying to undermine Hinduism because if Hindu, Hinduism comes on, again on center stage in the world, a lot of other traditions will struggle and disappear. 
including the, 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 this kind of fixation of materialism, which is, whole, which is kind of the main you know, fixture of humanity, that is under severe attack now. And Hinduism has got the answer. So there will be a lot of challenges, but a lot of positive things will happen. I mean, for example, Bill Gates and people like that love what Hinduism stands for, and we understand that. And they all praise Narendra Modi to the highest heaven, saying he's the best leader in the world. I wish the Queen, when she was addressing the Commonwealth Institute last time, uh, would not make announcement that when I retire, my son Charles will be the head of the Commonwealth. This is hereditary hierarchical caste system English way. So she should have said the most, the person most suitable to head the Commonwealth is this wonderful gentleman called Narendra Modi. Sorry, I'm digressing a lot, but I can't help myself. So we are getting praises from the genuine, sincere people who know the depth of Hinduism and value it. Look, the physicists that I love, like say, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, uh, you know, Niels Bohr, uh, Werner Heisenberg, the fathers of quantum physics, or Einstein, have always recognized the potency of Hinduism, not only in the field of spirituality, but in the field of science too. And that too is going to become visible in the days to come. <clears throat> you should buy any question from your side, sir? Nope. So, Jay, we talked about the end of materialism. Yes. And the rise of spirituality and science. Yes. Could you share a little bit more light on, on how you see that happening in the next couple of weeks or months or years to come ahead? Yes. I think it will happen within, within a year. What is happening is this. You may be surprised. Look, I'm a scientist and I'm talking with true, full integrity of a scientist as a physicist. Science is struggling. You'll be surprised to hear. There are a lot of issues in modern science that, are, that cannot be resolved. And the only resolution comes if they embrace a spiritual dimension to, our, to, the, to reality, which they are not prepared to do so far. Since 1920s, we discovered this phenomena called quantum, which is saying you must recognize a deeper dimension, which is non-material, to be the underpinning to this reality. Not matter, not matter. And he said, oh, but the whole of science body has been fixated on matter, trying to explain everything as lump of matter, and it's and its kind of attributes, it's you know, like charge and mass and spin and so on. And this is now failing dramatically. So they're going into purely a mathematical world, a metaphysical world to understand reality. And it is purely, purely almost like uh, Harry Potter stuff. So science is, theoretical physics is struggling with super strings and 11 dimensions, space time and all that. And they have no resolution. They're in a cul-de-sac. So modern science is struggling big time. and. In the, in the field of physics, very clearly, in the field of neuroscience, equally bad. They got people like Daniel Dennett trying to explain what is consciousness is an is a illusion created by the brain malfunction or something, you know, brain kind of misfiring, a mismatch between the brain's hardware and software. Come on, this is not a way of explaining consciousness. That's the very thing that allows me to have access to reality. You can't just explain this kind of mismatch between the hardware and software of the brain. So we are now in a new world whereby because materialism or the idea of explaining everything in terms of matter in science is now seriously under challenge and there are some interesting phys physicists who play, play ball with what I'm suggesting. So modern physics for it to progress further will have no choice but to embrace this kind of spiritual aspiration, spiritual dimension that we keep talking about. And I succeed. Whenever I do a talk at some of the top universities, I succeed because they can't challenge me. I'm saying the underpinning to reality is of the nature of existence. When existence shudders, that's called quantum, the universe appears. That's oh, all, it's true. But that is the, the teaching that comes from the spiritual aspect of Hinduism. So these kind of ideas that are at the heart of Hinduism will force the materialistic scientists to give up thinking within the box. You know, they can't think outside the material box. Everything must be matter and it's every phenomenon, including consciousness. This has to be shoved up, shoved aside. It's not me. Science itself is spit out, this kind of hard fixation on matter. And this is on the cards, I think within a year, especially with this, this coronavirus, people will rethink about materialism and the, the aspirations that we had and the way we fixation we had on matter is now severely challenged. So of course, we are in the, in the, in the, in a, I keep saying there is a, at the moment, there is a paradigm shift in, in the process. And the paradigm shift is to go from a highly materialistic vision to a spiritual vision. So this, if you like, is a positive thing that's coming out through this nasty thing called the coronavirus. So we are on the right track. And the only only religion, all, only tradition, look, I'm a bit, kind of showing off a little bit. The only tradition that can respond to the serious challenges of stepping out of a materialistic box is our tradition. So I am hoping and I'm wishing that uh, this, 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 this thing will allow this uh, deeper vision of Hinduism to enter society. This is what I'm planning to do. First of all, we want to make sure 
The Hinduism in its true dignity is promoted in the, in, in the educational system. And we are using this e-learning zone to try and do that. There are some teething problems. There is, you know, issue of, you know, things kind of taking a long time to download. We are fully aware. But then play along with us and try and follow through this course because it will give you very solid structured knowledge of your tradition and not just for hindus for people who are non-hindus who want to kind of see what is this hinduism all about so we'll try and promote this idea of a e-learning zone promoting the not just externals of hinduism how to tinkle bells and go and do this we are talking about the deeper vision of hinduism we talks about a spiritual dimension to reality and that is what we want to try and embrace and in a way infuse in society so our e-learning zone is, has got a vast kind of, you know, you know uh, uh, locus of operation. But we are not going to stop there. That's just our first target. The second target we have is for the greater humanity. Not just Hindus worldwide studying Hinduism, but in order to engage the thinking youngsters, the thinking people throughout the world who are looking for a deeper idea regarding what is all this going, what is going on. And we seem to be in a, in a you know, the, the world that we live in is surreal. It's not real anymore. Anything that we are fixation on life, we can't be sure about. Our, our material aspiration, we can't be sure about. Our economic future, we can't be sure about. So everything is rattled dramatically. So where do they turn? Who, what do they, where do they get their support to continue to living and not to become depressed? We hold the answer. And the second phase of our work will be kind of producing lots of interesting videos. We talks about end of materialism and what it entails and what it will produce and how, how positive it is. I'll just try and take some more questions from either uh, YouTube or from uh, Facebook. Just talk to her. Yes, sir. You should buy any further questions from you, sir? Yes, we have a couple of questions. So <clears throat> I'd just like to welcome Mehul Varambia. Uh, there is uh, Pratik Gulp from Kolkata. We've got Sam Matthew. And we have uh, uh, Neelam. Uh, Neelam Agarwal Singh watching us from North Northamptonshire, I think. Uh, and she's got a question from Northampton. So her question is, uh, how do we engage young people in understanding Hinduism? Yes. Uh, which is a beautiful religion. Okay, no, it's, it's nice to see the appreciation. We see our youngsters know there's something deep about our tradition, but they don't know what it is. And so they are stuck with this kind of very kind of legendary stories from the Puranis and the kind of the purely mechanical rituals that their parents are forcing onto them. So they know there is something deep there, but they don't know what is this depth. So we are saying study Hinduism in a structured manner. Look at the depth of Hinduism, not the externals, not the, the rituals and the festivals. And this is external. Look at the depth of Hinduism. And I'm telling you, you'll, your heart will be stolen. You will, you will fall in love with it. Nobody will come near you to try and convert you to the contrary. They'll run away from you thinking, my God, what is the, what a powerful tradition. And I'm finding this myself. Every time I interact with people of other tradition, they immediately, in no time, they turn pink in the face, but they fall in love with what we are presenting. So this is the way we are going to move forward. And we are going to promote the ideas that are central in Hinduism, which are to do with spiritual humanism, religious pluralism, the ideas of science and Hinduism or science and spirituality and the wonderful thing that we need to revisit, reincarnation. The resolution of the human condition is not in one lifetime, but over many lifetimes. This is a very mature, majestic idea that even David Hume, a great atheist scientist, said this is the best, this is the most logical way to think about life after death. So this is what we are planning to do. Yes, sir, you have some other question, Nishit Bhai? I'll give, uh, give it away to Manish Bhai. Sorry, Manish Bhai, we've been ignoring you. That's fine, right, sir. Um, so uh, we is, have a question. This, by the way, this is this is by the way this is Manish Bhai. In case you don't know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 you see, our team is so with tremendous sense of humor, tremendous sense of oneness, tremendous sense of teamwork. We are succeeding, and this these guys like Manish Bhai and Kaival and Sita and Jai Shank and Vijay and Nishit Bhai and Vijay Bhai. We've got a wonderful team here, so you, we can't lose. <laughs> anyway, go on. So, go on, Manish Bhai. Sir, we have a question. You just mentioned, uh, you know, religious pluralism. So, Ashish Narula is asking, what do you have to say about division in the name of religions and conflicts going on? You see, the, 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 the funny part is this. The, the coronavirus had, has brought all the religious community very close together, and they huddle, each, huddle with each other. Do you know why? They have got a common enemy. <laughs> So they feel at one with each other. They're all struggling. Their gods are not stepping into sort of the coronavirus. They're all in the same boat. 
So they are huddling together. But the good thing is this, some of the exclusivist ideas that they were kind of hanging on to are now under challenge. So they think if we have the answer, our God is going to step in, and our God doesn't step in that easily, so this looks terrible. So they don't know, they don't know how to... They don't know how to react. So this idea of pluralism that our mentors Sorry, there's a lot of uh, sounds, crackling sounds, so I had to stop it. Okay, so our, what our mentors have actually have been promoting for the last 100 years or 150 years is the idea of pluralism. Look how beautiful this is. See how you re relate to it. He says, in order to be spiritual, you, you can in a way use different pathways to be spiritual, not even religious, spiritual, something that you feel something grand about you and this reality. So they say there are many different ways of exploring spirituality. You can use a monotheist mode, I believe in the idea of ultimate reality as Jesus or God in the heaven or um, Vishnu or Shiva. You're welcome to do that. That has been a wonderful way of relating to spirituality for thousands of people over thousands of years. Nothing wrong with it. So we recognize a monotheist approach in making spiritual progress. We don't undermine any of them. Say, go for it. We say, this is the way you want to relate to spirituality, focusing on the super personality. Go for it, my friend. It is a tried and tested pathway. It will take you to the destination. Go to your destination. Don't fight about the prescription. Other people have their own monotheist God. Let them follow their pathway and reach their own destination. We are affirming that the final destination is the same, like it or not. You hit the same jackpot, like it or not. This is what we suggest. So we give a reconciliation of you know, using different religious pathways to make spiritual progress. And these religious pathways can be monotheistic. We have no problem with monotheistic God. We love him. Yahoo! Okay. We say it's not that only. Suppose you want to be spiritual without a monotheist God. Say Buddhism. There's no question of God. He's not saying there's no God. He's simply there's no need for a God. We just, in a way, resolve our human condition by becoming enlightened. See? No monotheism. So we allow for that as well. So non-theistic way of becoming spiritual in, say, Buddhism and also in Jainism. There's no creator God in Jainism either. It doesn't stop there. Within the esoteric Hindu tradition, we say you can think of ultimate reality or spirituality not sitting in the heaven as super personality, but as your essential nature and the essential nature of the universe that you encounter. And the words we use are Atman and Brahman. People don't know what they are, but they are saying your actual, actual, your true nature is something different from what you think it is. We are not Descartes. There's something deeper within you. So we are saying, search for your true essential nature. That will make you spiritual. See Ramana Maharshi, do you think he's bothered about gods and goddesses? He's, he's enlightened. So this is, if you like, esoteric Hinduism, which is non-theistic, doesn't focus on any, any specific god, doesn't vilify any god, but is not fixated on any god. And yet it recognizes the dignity which is within us, all of us. This is called ideas of non-theistic Hinduism, making spiritual progress without reference to a theos, without a god. Nothing wrong. Do we stop there? We are greedy people. We say, look at the power of this. You see, if it doesn't steal your heart, I don't think what else will steal your heart. We say, what we sometimes vilify as secular kind of activities, provided they make you one-pointed and focused. Remember, the words are one-pointed and focused and disciplined. They will lead you to the same destination as the religious people. Oh, secular way of being spiritual. Yes. We say, look. The reason why we'll say, suppose somebody says, I love music, Mr. Lakani, I don't know why. I just love music. I said, you know why? Through that particular process, when you're listening or playing an instrument, you become so one-pointed with your instrument and with the sound coming out that in a way it leads you to your true nature as a spirit. It makes you so one-pointed and focused. It gives you a thrill. And the thrill doesn't come from outside. It comes from within you. This is why you love music. So we say, the thrill will come from within you through the process of music. Or same we say art, or dance, or drama, or literature, or poetry. We love poetry. You know, the mystic poets, Wordsworth. They're talking about spiritual underpinning to reality. So we say through any of these what are called secular or vilified as secular activities, you can be spiritual. And this is wonderful, isn't it? So you see the, the breadth of pluralism. You can focus on a monotheist God, good luck to you. You can focus on your own essential nature, good luck to you. You can think about becoming enlightened, good luck to you. We say you can just focus on any secular activities like dance, drama, music, you know, put poetry, literature. And you know what's the, ma the major prize humanity has? Science. Science allows us to become the most, gives us the most unified way of looking at reality. Science. So the science is not something, it is a, the integrity of science is now very clearly showing us a spiritual underpinning to reality. So we are saying just focus on science. So when we say genuine scientists, well, mature scientists, not fixate on matter and fixing things, something deeper here. 
then these mature scientists are going to discover the same thing we are talking about a religion and God and spirituality using the, 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 the integrity of science. Let me tell you one thing. I said at one of these lectures at universities, I said, look, in the past, prophets of the past were able to excite perhaps a dozen youngsters or a dozen devotees who were kind of worked up about spirituality and made spiritual progress. Good luck to them. But I say the real, real gem, it is the science of today, not tomorrow, not tomorrow's world, science of today, that will in a way thrill not hundreds, not thousands, millions of youngsters who relate to spirituality in no uncertain term because it comes with the, with the label of science. So it's a science of today that will lead people to spirituality, back to spirituality, without talks and tales of religion. So I'm, you know, kind of, we are flowing in a very beautiful, at the moment, the science is very, very rich and very, very clear about its aspiration, which is non-material. So I'm saying you can be religious using a variety of different ploys, theistic, non-theistic, secular, and still achieve the same target. And who says this? You see, unless I had some, look, I'm talking from, a lot of things I speak from, are from personal experience and not just purely book learning. So sometimes people send me stuff from the Sanskrit saying, oh, Parshuram said this, How, what do you interpret? I say, leave me alone. I'm not an expert in Sanskrit. I talk in modern language in a sensible manner using the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, the modern proponents of spirituality on the Indian stage. So that is how I learn my stuff. So I am saying these modern proponents have really in a way pointed direction saying this is the future of humanity. And it is coming now, not only through, you know, religious activities, but through science itself. I'll take some more questions. Nishit Bhai, have I, have I, you, I must have stirred you up to ask me some very pointed questions, sir. You throw, <coughs> you throw, yes, you throw, you throw yes, go on. Before I can pose questions, I see a lot of questions on Facebook today. Yeah. So I'm just going to just say hello to a few people. We got Vaikun Dempo watching us from Goa. We got Ashok Kumar. We got uh, Bharti Mehta, we've got uh, uh, Krishna Thakra and a few others. So the question number one I've got is, uh, uh, where is it? Yep, yeah, so Krishna Thakra is asking, would we be wrong in thinking that there is a parallel uh, in the current pandemic uh, as, a, as a modern day Mahabharata, where the virus <laughs> is a part of the humans being the core of us. <laughs> Oh dear, dear. Now, by the way, let me explain. This Krishna Bhai Thakrar is one of our main teachers of Hinduism in the Middle East. So we know him very well and he's, he's got a habit of asking such rude questions, rude pointed questions. So we, we love that. Okay, he's equating Kauros and Pandas with humanity and, cow, and coronavirus. Please, Krishna Bhai, leave it alone. Don't, don't give coronavirus even the dignity of being Kauros. <laughs> it's, it's a nasty thing that sprung out from nowhere. He's knocking the hell out of everybody. All the economy of the world, everything is frozen. Everything is in lockdown. It's fr frightening scenario and we don't see an end to this end of the tunnel. We are still struggling and the lockdown may continue God knows for how long and the moment they lift the lockdown and people like me go out we might catch the virus so we have to run back in the house and hide ourselves so things are very bad. It's much worse than Mahabharata I'm saying this is a this is a Mahabharata on the international scale not Hindu scale, international scale so that's all I'll say. Anything else that you want to ask? Yep. So, we had the question from Vaikun Tempo from yeah. Goa Hmm. And the question was an interesting one, saying, how do you find oneness between Hinduism and other traditions? Ah, I love this question. Thank you, sir, for asking. You see, I'll notice this. A lot of people who are liberal in their thinking, who are not fixated on exclusivist, even within their own tradition, are recognizing that religion or spirituality cannot be an exclusivist or monopoly of one particular tradition, including Hinduism. We never ask, we never say we are monopoly on spirituality, we never made any such claim. Do you know what we say? This is the Kathopanishad. We say we don't even, even have one, you know, one percent of grasp of spirituality. We are still fumbling. Our linguistic ploys, our intellectual ploys cannot even grasp what is spirituality. It is an experiential thing, but we are, struggle, we are struggling to give it kind of, you know, articulate it in intellectual terms. So we will recognize the limitation of every tradition, including Hinduism, as just being, if you like, a partial glimpse into spirituality, partial glimpse. 
So that is why when people, there are people of other traditions who are also recognize that their traditions are wonderful, guiding them to make spiritual progress, but they are also in a way, in a way limited to their own tradition, to their own community, and the, the material that they are focusing on spirituality or God is far vaster, far grander than their ability to capture it within their own system of thinking. So I meet people of other tradition, many Christians especially, even some Muslims by the way, who say, Mr. Lakani, we relate to this idea of pluralism, but we can't acknowledge it openly because our tradition will not allow us. We have to be exclusive, otherwise we, kick, we get kicked out of our tradition. So they are struggling, but in the heart of their hearts, they know that this idea of a broader vision regarding religion, which allows people of different religions to coexist honestly, peacefully, without watering down, is there, and they are prepared to never embrace it. It's become, becoming more and more visible day by day. But I have to be very careful. I don't want to step into the territory of other religions and try and tell them, do this, don't do this, because they've got their own tradition. I'm not here to undermine that. I'm simply saying, please recognize there's a broader, broader vision that you need to embrace in order to be able to relate to people of other religion as well as people of no religion. So I love this idea. And do you know why? My mentor, Sri Ram Krishna, he said, I'll try out all the Hindu pathways to make spiritual progress. He did that, he succeeded. Then he said, I'm, not, I'm greedy. I want to find out if other traditions are true. So use the pathways of other traditions like the Christianity, Islam, to see if it takes him to the same spiritual experience. He said, yes. Even the theology that goes around with Christianity, Islam, maybe kind of, you know, canter us or maybe kind of exclusive is, the underpinning is there, it is true. But the, the theology that kind of shrouds those traditions in a way are sometimes very exclusivist and troublesome. And that is what we are finding. That creates the friction in the name of religion. But fortunately now, I suspect, the world is becoming very mature. The youngsters today are becoming mature. Some of the Christian youngster. He looks at me, he says, Mr. Lakhan, you seem to be a sincere person, honest person, genuine person. How can you be sent to hell because you don't believe in Christ? So you see, the straight way, you can see this vision now visible with the modern thinking youngsters worldwide, especially in the United Kingdom. He, this country is very vibrant and very open and very, very, very in inclusive is automatically. So we are now, the world is changing and UK is leading this particular pr process of becoming pluralistic. UK is leading. I'll take some more questions. Reality as it is becomes revealed when the mind stops chattering. Unfortunately, this happens only sometimes. Accidentally, it can happen. Suddenly, you sit and suddenly everything comes, you know, slow, slows down. The world appears to slow down and you get a deeper glimpse into reality. It happens. It happens to. Taking to, like we said, uh, alcohol abuse or domestic violence and things like that. But uh, Mehul uh, heard somewhere that. A physiologist said that if we pass 66 days in quarantine, it will lead to people becoming much more kinder. Ah, that's a good reason. I think, I hope it is right. Because in a way, look, in a way, when you are kind of isolated, you think deeper about everything. And the super, the superfluous ideas are like going to weddings and going to parties and getting drunk they appear kind of unnecessary, unwanted. So in a way, the silence of this kind of very, you know, the isolation that is imposed on us may allow us to become spiritually and, you know, spiritually more kind of attracted to spiritual ideas. And that is very, very likely and very possible. But the thing is, is the funny part is this. I just looked at the statistics. They said the, the sales of alcohol in the last, last two weeks has gone up by 33%. So you can see what is happening. People are saying, we don't know what the heck is this coronavirus. We are fed up with it. We have to stay at home. So let us get in a stupor. Let's just get drunk and just watch any movies or whatever that we comes to comes to a hand and live like that. So human beings, some will, some will f fall back on the lower aspirations, you know, become, becoming much more kind of animally, animalistic. And some may focus on the higher aspiration. But so be it. This is, humanity is like that. And we, we smile. We don't say, oh, how dare you drink wine? It is their way of addressing the, the, the distress they are facing. So we play ball with them. So, so his question is that, okay, we have got this chance to hit the reset button and focus on things which are more important to us, inward and outward around us. But once life starts getting back to normal, we know that people will be distracted again. And <laughs> he's asking for your, your sort of guidance on what can people do to stick with the new good habits that they've got during this time. Okay. Look, I'll be very, very, it's, I will be very honest. If tomorrow they discover a vaccine, which is doubt, doubtful, but suppose they do, and they say we can manufacture this in millions within a month, the, the whole world will go singing, dancing back to normal, and we'll forget about spirituality, forget about Jay Lakhani, forget about all these ideas that we've been plugging in. They'll throw it on the, they'll spit them out. I don't blame them. 
Humanity operates at the level of animal, mostly animalistic level. And we have to go back to our animal nature. So the moment this virus is you know, lifted, the straight way we go back jumping and dancing and the stock market will shoot up and the oil price will shoot up, everything start changing. So be it. So this is what we live in. So I'm not saying, oh, it's not good. So let, it be, let us find a vaccination earlier the better because humanity is struggling. So I'm not going to stop it. But the way things are at the moment, I doubt if it's going to be stopped so easily. So it's a long-term battle like most clear, clear scientists are telling us. So it's a long-term issue. Now, what will happen is this. The longer it goes on, the more chances are that, that we are now getting used to a different way of looking at reality and ourselves and our condition. So the longer it drags on, the more we'll be kind of attuned to focusing on spiritual aspiration rather than material aspiration. So if it drags on, we'll be so focused on spiritual things, this is a material thing, buying a new car and going on a cruise, I couldn't be bothered. So you might go reach there, but I can't be sure. It depends on humanity. I'm not in charge of humanity. They've got their own mind and they kind of operate in the way that suits them and so be it. I'll take some more questions, sir. Uh, yes, over to Manish Bhai. Okay, Manish Bhai. Hello, Manish Bhai. I think you know what's happened, Nishit Bhai? Yes. Manish Bhai's phone or my phone, the battery is gone down. I can't reach him. He's got switched okay. off. So please carry on. Fine, so I will then ask you uh, quickly. Yeah. Which is uh, the fact that why don't we as a species take more advantage of the fact that we have almost infinite knowledge available to us. Yes, in fact, look, we are doing that. Haven't we noticed? Look, somebody was saying, oh, Mr. Lakhani, you know, we should go back to the ancient medication and all this herbal, herbal stuff to sort of. So I said, no, my friend, evolve, evolve. Your tradition allows you to evolve. You could use modern technology to kind of make sense of the world that you live in and address the issues you face like the coronavirus. So we can say, evolve. So we are quite happy with this. And the good thing is this, look, that some of the last, the big, biggest kind of disasters we had, uh, health disasters were like the smallpox, yellow fever, cholera, polio, and they took long period before we could control them because humanity was still evolving and so on, uh, HIV and Ebola, we were able to resolve it very fast and control it within literally a few months or within a few years. So this virus, even though it's creating hell for us, within a short period, maybe one or two years, we'll definitely get it under control. This is the sign of the spirit. So the, the spirit that is within all of us, within all of humanity is so powerful, it can resolve any issues that's thrown in his face. So the material world that we live in will throw in challenges like the coronavirus, but the spirit that we possess, which says, I don't like to be pushed around by material, material forces, I am the spirit, I rule matter. I'll, I'll overcome all of these material calamities and ride above it. That is the sign of humanity, the sign of the spirit. So I have tremendous confidence in humanity and its ability to fight and stand up against all the serious challenges it faces. And I think we are on the right track. So we should we should come out winner, but through a very difficult patch. But life is, <laughs> what to do? Look, I'm stuck in my home. All my musketries are stuck. I can't see my granddaughter. I scream, what to do? But I have to smile and live with it. I'll take some more questions from you, Nishit Bhai, because Manish Bhai is fished off, yep. unfortunately. I, I'm also checking YouTube now. So mm -hmm. I'm really, really uh, happy to see we've got viewers tuning in all the way from the US, Malaysia, UAE, India, UK, and many, many other places and, and really interesting questions. So a question from Anuj Mishra is that a person can get confused between a rope and a snake. But how can something which is absolute be delusions? How Brahman itself is delusion? Why, <laughs> what, how is Maya? <laughs> oh, you explored this question many a time, but don't mind doing it one more time. Look, the early way of defining Maya in the time of Adi Shankar, he had to use some, some kind of vocabulary, some kind of linguistic ploy to understand what this Maya is all about. And the nearest he could come across was this idea of sna snake and rope. He said, Maya is like, suppose in the evening you're walking and you see a piece of rope and you mistake it for snake. It's, ah, I'm frightened, it's a snake. And you know, he said, it's not right. He said, it's an illusion. So this is how he tried to explain the concept of Maya. What is and what it appears as is Maya. This is how he tried to, you know, trying to explain it. But then you see, in modern world, this particular definition doesn't work. Because scientists will say, look, suppose there's an illusion, we can throw better light on the rope to make sure it's a rope. So we can, we've got technology, we can, suppose you're you know, driving in the United States on a sunny day and long, long road, at the end of the road, you can see a glimmer of some water. You see, there's a lake there. You know, there's no lake. 
And you see, it's an illusion of a lake on the sunny day and the, and the long, long road, in the, you know, where they're driving. They, but the scientists say, don't be frightened. We can resolve it. We can show you that how the sunlight has been, been kind of, in a way, bent and shows up as, if you like, water at the end of the, end, end of the road. It's not real. So we can give you a mechanism whereby you can overcome the illusion or that you, there is a water there. So they'll find a way of overcoming the illusion, a material illusion, to get you over the illusion. Now, so far, so good. So, so this idea of Adi Shankara will not hold water now. And then we have this modern mentor, my mentor, Vivekananda. He said, look, he's not undermining Adi Shankara. He's simply saying the best way to define Maya is not an illusion, not the right word, he said. Illusion you can overcome using better technology. He said the best way to define Maya is to say there is a disjoint between what is and what it appears as. There's a disjoint. You say, but there must be some link. How can one become appear like other? There must be some causal link, cause and effect link between what is and what it appears as. He said, there is no causal link. He said, that's why it's called disjoint between what is and what it appears as. So this pristine perfection underpinning reality, Brahman, when it manifests, appears as the creation, there is a disjoint. And you say, but how can that become? When you ask that question, I say, we can't answer it because I told you it's a disjoint. Causality doesn't work. There's no causal link between what is and what it appears as. If there was a causal link, I could say, okay, now I know how to stop it. And why this, uh, this, this uh, Brahman had some fault. That's why this causality shows that it's kind of, because it had a fault, it appeared as a ball that we see it. There is no causal link. That's why it's a permanent disjoint. That's the language used by Vivekananda. So this is the better way of explaining Maya. There's a disjoint between what is and what appears. There is no causal link. If there's a causal link, the Brahman is in trouble. He's got a flow that he appears as this nasty world that we live in. So there is no causal link. There's a disjoint. What is and what appears, you can't link it. There's no linkage. There's no causal link. So you can't say, oh, but how did Brahman become so illusioned? It, it doesn't become illusion. It was never illusion. There's no causal link. But you say, Mr. Lakhan is still pure, very floaty stuff. How can you believe in stuff? Only reason why I believe is it's a matter of experience. When you experience what this Brahman is all about, then this disjoint doesn't become, you see, you can see through it. And the lovely way my master explains Sri Ramakrishna is this. When you get a glimpse of Brahman, this is what he said. Look, it's such a beautiful example he uses. He uses a very rustic example. This is supposed to go to the lakeside, and there's some kind of green moss on the surface of the lake. So you can't see the water. It's all green moss. He said, you take a stick, and you push the green moss aside, and you see the the crystal water underneath. You say, wow, wow, what is it? What is it? This is what happens when you have experience of Brahman. But then you take your stick away and then what happens? These are his words. He says, the, the green moss comes dancing back and covers up the, the, the lovely spring, sparkling water and you are back in your normal world. So the, the world that I experienced Brahman, the next minute I say, no, I'm here, I'm Jay Lakhani. And I say, God, what happened? So we get stuck back and exactly how this happens? I just give you this example of Sri Ramakrishna again. That's all I can say. But it's a wonderful thing to explore. Look, my friend, at the deeper level, the only way you can resolve, understand this thing called Brahman or Atman is first an experience. Nothing else will do. Any intellectual gymnastics I give, any examples I give, any metaphors I give will fail, will not take you forward. You need to have, you say, but how do I get in this Lakhani? I don't know. Again, there's the disjoint. There's no causal way saying, you do this, get up at five o'clock and take a bath and you get, you know, there's no fixed rule. It hits you. When it hits you, you know you've been hit, but in a nice way. <laughs> I'll take some more questions from Nishit Bhai. Yep. So we have a question from Selena in the USA. And the question, I'm going to roll it up with a few other questions. I'll ask you. You can answer them uh, at your own Go ahead. Go ahead, Nishit Bhai. The question was how to learn the fundamentals and mechanics of Hinduism. That was followed by another question, which is, which is the, the one book that you can recommend for the beginner in Hinduism to start with? Yes. Any more? And the third question was, uh, we'll start with these two. First. Okay, let's do Let's start. Okay. You see, the, the, the e-learning course we offered is, you know, we've got a bit of teething problem because it takes buffering time is long, etc. But play ball with it. It's not that, that dramatic in this world that we live in. So the e-learning zone is quite, quite well focused. So it gives you a very structured understanding of your tradition, of Hindu tradition, as you say, from scratch. And in a very systematic manner, the experiential dimension, the, the, the narrative dimension, the ritual dimension, the philosophic dimension, the social cultural dimension. So we are kind of progressing in a nice way. It is not too heavy handed. It is not too heavy-handed either. 
I don't know what's happening with Manish, Nishit Bhai. His phone is going to rattle rattle. I think he's playing drums or something. Are you all right, Manish Bhai? Nishit Bhai? <laughs> okay. So, so follow the course. That will give you kind of a structured understanding of tradition. It's very basic. It's called basic Hinduism. And then we have advanced Hinduism, etc., which we, where we actually focus on teaching about specific Upanishads and teachings of modern prof proponents of Hinduism like Ramakrishna. So we've got all this thing kind of following through. So it's a long, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. That's one way you can understand. But suppose you say, what book to focus on? I'll tell you what book. The thing is this, we are so fortunate that we produce super giants, spiritual giants in our own times. Suppose I say, look up Vashishta, Vishwamitra, and you know, you, Yog Vashishta, Ramayana, or Valmiki Ramayana, or, or uh, Tusidas Ramayana. Look, it is fine. But the time has come where we can now think about our reality and spirituality in modern terms with spiritual giants of our own time. If you are genuinely interested in spirituality, if you are genuinely interested in spirituality, why do you want to go back to the antique stuff? It's fine unless you like you are an antique dealer. And look, I get emails from people saying, now what is the meaning of this thing? Because they are very focused, they're very kind of relevant in the world that we live in. So idea is to focus on modern spiritual giants. If you want to say which book, look, I tell you what book. If you look at the look at the, the say the for example the, the 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 teachings of some of the masters, you still struggle. Look at their lives, the lives of Sri Ramakrishna and the life of Swami Vivekananda. Just study them. If that doesn't give the, if it'll charge you off, it'll set you off on your spiritual journey. I'm telling you, promising you. The life of Vivekananda, the life of Sri Ramakrishna will charge you up. Say, what? What a, what, a, what a story. Is it for real in our own times? Yes. That is why I said, if you want to get your start, journey started and you're looking for a specific book, I'm not even saying Bhagavad Gita, see? I'm saying follow the life, not even the teachings of some of the modern spiritual giants like Ramana Maharshi, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda. They are solid, genuine spiritual giants of our times. Focus on them. There are lots of others who are on the periphery. I love them as well, like Arvindo, etc. But I don't promote, because they are, these guys are so charged up and so kind of, you know, intense in their in the explanation that others become secondary. Look, it, it's, it's Vivekanand who charged up Arvindo. It is Vivekanand who charged up, uh, you know, um, Narendra Modi. It is Vivekanand who charged up Subhash Chandra Bose. So some of the major kind of personalities of modern times have been charged up by Vivekanand. So I'm saying, look, I'm charged up by him. Not because I'm trying to promote some sectarian cultish movement, God forbid, because the material is so dynamic. He, does, he doesn't want to promote himself. He said, grow up and stand on your feet and sort yourself out. That's, the, that's my advice. So you should have to take, put, the, put your phone away because there was a lot of rattling going on and I thought you were playing drums. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, we are now at 55 minutes into the broadcast. Okay, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Do you have any final words for our viewers? Look, my friends, I would re recommend that the e-learning th thing that we have kind of launched is very dynamic. It will be slow and there will be teething problems. Encourage your youngsters or youngsters that you know in other parts of the world to subscribe. This is international. You don't have to be Hindu. Allow other people to kind of, in a way, participate and join this course and you'll soon get a hang of it. And then as we go along, we'll go into much more esoteric ideas that are visible regarding science and spirituality. That will become visible as well. Anyway, I think we should, with that, Nishit Bhai, I leave it to you to wrap up the program. Yes, uh, so I always like to wrap up with a quote from Swami Vivekananda. And what it says, today's quote is very interesting. It says, external nature is only internal nature writ large. <laughs> okay, I think we should finish with that. Thank you, sir. Uh, yep, so with that, I will just tell all the viewers to join us next week on Saturday, same time at 2 o'clock. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nishit Bhai and Manish Bhai. Thank you, sir. Okay.